a nearly nine month old baby. And so this is the first time I got to do that. Uh, and so I'm gonna need you to talk back to me and, uh, and just make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, make sure that, that this is clear. Okay, so if, you've ever, ever part, if you've ever participated in a sermon of mine, please, today's the day. Okay, all right. Uh, 2023, 2023, two more months. Two more months, November and December. Schools are closing in a couple of days, a couple of weeks. Work is finishing around mid-December, depending on where you work. There's eight more Mondays. Eight more Mondays to the year. Okay, eight more Mondays. I don't know if that's an encouragement or a discouragement. Six weekends until Christmas. Six weekends. If you're going to get everything done on those weekends, you've got six more. 57 more days. 57 more days. 1,368 hours. 82,080 minutes. 4,924,800 more seconds. And so how does that make you feel? Excited, good, that's a very good thing. We heard some of the New Year's resolutions. Some people are trying to get in shape. We, some people wanted to unpack their house. How's that going for you? They're not going. What about uh, if you look back to all those things that you've put off until, you know, once I'm sorted, I'll figure it out. Then I'll figure it out. Just let me just get this sorted. How are your aspirations for 2023 going? <clears throat> what about even the godly things, right? I'm not just talking about fitness and, and uh, productivity tools. I'm talking about the godly things. Plugging into community, becoming a member at Root Fellowship, going to family group, reading your Bible, praying more. How's that going? Serving. What's your plan for Christmas this year? Are you going away? Or have I just reminded you that you need to think about a plan for Christmas? What about lunch? Are you gonna provide? Who's gonna provide? Maybe you're stressing about provisions. Are you wondering about gifts that you need to buy certain people? How are you gonna pay for the holidays? Are you thinking about the Black Friday deals coming up? Maybe that'll miss, sort out your problems. How's your take a lot cart looking? You know, you're waiting for the right time just to click purchase. And on Christmas Day, how are you feeling about that? Some of y'all have started planning like last Christmas for this year's Christmas. Some of you just don't even want to think about it. Some of you are already thinking about the cleanup to Christmas Day lunch and how hectic that's going to be. So many guests, how are you gonna make it? Well, my message today, uh, it's my prayer that this would be a message that encourages you and keeps you keep on going. That you would finish the year strong, but not by worldly standards. Remember family, God's kingdom is upside down. It's completely upside down to the kingdom of this world. Jesus calls us to live day by day and not to be anxious about anything. We saw this in, in, in our post-pandemic series when we looked at Luke 12. Do not be anxious about anything. Live day to day. But the world says, get busy. Get busy worrying. And so originally when prepping this message, I thought that it was gonna be a call to pause, to slow down and to rest. And it is that, right? Okay, so if that's what you've come here looking for today, it is that. But it's, it's so much more. Truth be told, it is so much more. My prayer is that this message comes at the right time and gives you the encouragement and the strength to keep on keeping on. God's people throughout the centuries have been Christians who keep on keeping on. And that we would embrace the rest of 2023. And that where needs be, we would pivot, refocus and reprioritize so that we may finish the year as more mature followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, amen? This is not gonna be a motivational message that's gonna enable you to have it all and get it all done. And it's also not gonna be a message that gives us permission to check out of everything. It's my hope that it'll be a message that calls us to finish the year as more mature followers of Jesus. The message today 
is a call to even more mature discipleship. Wherever you are, it's a call to even more mature discipleship. We're a disciple-making church, amen? We're unashamed about this, and the, today's message, as every Sunday does, calls us to grow in our discipleship and in our maturity as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a disciple-making message, and so if discipleship is your thing, as it should be for all of the followers of Jesus Christ, you're in for a treat. Okay, so let's go to our text for today. Our text comes from Luke 10, Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. It's, for, it's four verses. It's a short one because I've reminded you about how many seconds you've got left for the 2023, uh, and so it's a short one. Okay, Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. You can meet us in your Bible. I'm going to be reading, reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Alternatively, it is going to be up on the screen. Luke 10, verse 38 to 42. Hear the words of our Father. It says, While they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Father, we thank you that we have your word. Lord God, we thank you that we can gather like this. We thank you that we can come at this time right now and, and, and set our gaze upon you. And that we can come and hear from your word. We thank you that we have your word in a written form that we can understand, that we can read, Lord God. That we can hear from you. We thank you for this space. Lord God, we adore you for the fact that you are eternal, you are everlasting, you are faithful, you are good, you are glorious, God. And so we come today as your people. Lord God, draw our gaze upwards, off of our issues, and to you, into your eyes, Lord God. Thank you that we can come into your presence in the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done on the cross in dying for our sins and making a way for us to know you, Father, to relationship with you, to, to know you intimately. And so, Lord God, I, I pray that we would come now and humbly sit at your feet and receive this message. Lord God, I pray for those of us in here looking for healing. Lord God, looking for clarity, looking for discernment, looking for your touch, Lord God, looking for you. I pray that you would meet each and every single one of us where we are. You are a faithful God who does that, Lord God, and so we, we ask that you would do it again. Remind us of your goodness, remind us of who you are, remind us of who is we are. Come and have your way in us, Holy Spirit. Come now, Holy Spirit, we wait on you. Come and do a mighty work. We pray all of this in Jesus' mighty, holy, beautiful name. Amen and amen. Now, family, I've preached a number of times this year, and as I've done that, I've preached most of my time in Luke's gospel, okay? Uh, and each time I've done that, I preach from Luke's gospel, you remember that I've said that the gospel of Luke is one of the earliest written accounts of Jesus' life. Remember, this gospel account was the first of two volumes written by the gospel writer Luke, found in our Bible in what we call the New Testament, so the books written after the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel writer, Luke, writes the gospel of Luke, and then he writes the book of Acts. Two volumes that he writes. Luke became a follower of Jesus because of spending time with the apostle Paul. And he comes to faith in Jesus after experiencing the absolute transforming grace of the gospel. Originally, he was a doctor or a physician, but he trades in this day job to be a co-worker with the apostle Paul trades in his doctor day job to be a co-worker of the Apostle Paul to spread the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke writes his gospel in a way that highlights to his audience that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promises 
in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus Christ has come to fulfill all of God's promises from the Old Testament scriptures. And so he highlights those in his gospel. And he writes his gospel in an extremely detailed way. He's very intentional about every detail that he records. And he orders his account in a very particular and precise way. So I want you to bear that in mind as it comes out next. Now, first nine chapters, remember we're in Luke chapter 10. First nine chapters of Luke's gospel, Luke shows how Jesus brings the good news of God's kingdom to the people of Israel. And he specifically notes that Jesus taught that God's kingdom is, as we said before, upside down. It's a reversal of the world's common social values. We've actually seen this already, right? right? Like as we read our text, we could see that we don't even need to dive deeply into that text to see that the world tells us to get busy and to take control like Martha. Our nature tells us to be anxious and worried. But what does Jesus say? He says, first sit at my feet. Devote yourself in worship to me. We were reminded, Clarinda reminded us this morning as we had a call to worship. She said, our emotions, they, they are fleeting, but our devotion is what God calls us to. Intentional, consistent devotion. Jesus' ways are radically upside down to the ways of this world. Chapters 1 through 9. Then, the next section of the Gospel of Luke, where we found our text for this morning, Luke 10, forms part of the center section of the book of Luke. And in this section... Jesus takes his followers on a journey from Galilee toward Jerusalem, with Luke showing us that being a follower of Jesus or his disciple means very much participating in Jesus' mission, making it the central part of your everyday life. Following Jesus means making Jesus the central part of your everyday life. Pastor Onay has said this before. He said, it's not just that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit is the first thing on the list of things to do. He is the list. He is the page. And so with that, I'm going to walk us through our, our short text for today. Let's look at verse 38. Verse 38. While they were traveling, while they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha, welcomed him into her home while they were traveling. So who's they? Who's they in this text? Jesus and the 12 disciples? Yes and no. It's not only these 13 people that are coming to Martha's house for lunch. If we go back to Luke 8, verses 1 to 3, we see that Luke says, Luke 8, verses 1 to 3, he says, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12, being the 12 disciples, were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. Many others. So this was a large group of people, right? And scholars and commentators say that most likely Mary and Martha from our text today, we're already most likely part of the discipleship crew that tr Jesus already traveled with, okay? So they've been traveling, now they're stopping over at Martha's place. It's a big crowd. Carrying on, verse 38. He entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. He entered a village, and was welcomed by Martha. Now, the village that they enter is undoubtedly Bethany, okay? We, we, we see this from John 11. Many of y'all will recall the amazing sermons that we had this year, Pastors Adam and Pastors Joby from Church of 1122, our partner churches uh, in Jacksonville. They came out here and they preached on separate occasions. They preached on John 11, on the raising of Lazarus, and, Mary and the brother of Mary and Martha, and they speak about Lazarus being in Bethany. And so the village that Jesus enters here is in Bethany. Now, uh, why doesn't you, <laughs> Luke just say Bethany? Right? Well, that's a sermon for another day. You see, he's clearly wanting to emphasize not the territory that Jesus is in, but the home of the person who Jesus is in. That's Martha. Verse 38 tells us, Martha. And so Martha was most likely widowed or unmarried. Otherwise, Luke would have referred to the home by her husband's name. Because that was the custom of the time. 
And because he says it was Martha who welcomed him into her home, she must have been the older sister of Mary and the hostess. Okay, so she was the older sister of Mary, the hostess. She, she'd be, um, I'm hoping my pronunciation is, is correct here, she'd be our kind of, our day, me wale lapa, me wale lapa. That's who, who Martha would be. Good. Right. Thank you. Keep the affirmations coming and just remember, remind me I'm, I'm, I'm on mineral sleep here. Verse 39. <coughs> She had a sister named Mary. Martha had a sister named Mary who also sat. So there's a number of people sitting. Who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. So there are a bunch of people at Jesus' feet listening to what he says. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I, I've heard this story throughout my time in church, when we read this, I think we kind of see Mary as chilling like this. Martha's busy in the kitchen, and Mary's chilling. You know, oh man, how's it going? You know, oh yeah. Can Martha get you something to drink? You know? Um, and that's how we think of her as sitting. Okay? Mary's just kicking, kicking it in the, in the lounge, chilling, uh, whilst there's a lot going on in the kitchen. But the phrase that Luke uses for sat at the Lord's feet is the same one that he uses two chapters back in Luke 8, verse 35, when he writes, people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man the demons had departed from sitting at Jesus' feet. Sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. So Mary is responding to Jesus in the same way that a man who had been tormented his whole life by demons responds to Jesus. Once Jesus is healed. Go read the account in Luke 8. It's incredible. But here we have a man who was tormented by multiple demons for multiple years. Then one day he meets Jesus. Jesus banishes these demons and in doing so heals this man from seizures. And now this man who lived as a total outsider in society living in the tombs, the graveyard, is now restored to full physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And he responds to Jesus, how? And does what? He sits at his feet. Now, if that was you, and that happened, how do you think you'd be sitting at Jesus' feet? I think it would be like this. Absolute awe, wonder, gratitude, and devotion. That's how this man was sitting at Jesus' feet. And that's how Mary and others are sitting at Jesus' feet in this account. So clearly this phrase that Luke uses both the, in both of these texts is used to describe Jesus' followers' worship and devotion to, devotion to his teachings. It's used to describe their devotion to his teachings and to worship of Jesus. Why? Why? Because Jesus has transformed their entire lives. He has came and healed, and he has made a way for them to know their creator God. He has utterly transformed their lives. And so that's how they respond. Mary is taking her rightful place as a disciple at Jesus' feet, hanging on every word that Jesus is saying, because he has absolutely transformed her entire life. She's devoted to to what he's teaching. She's being a mature disciple and follower of Jesus Christ, an obedient follower of Jesus Christ, hanging on every word. We see a similar kind of devotion in the early church. Back in Acts 2, and also uh, Luke wrote Acts as well, remember I mentioned that. So in Acts 2, he speaks of the early church who gathered and did what? Devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings about who? about Jesus. Friends, family, brothers and sisters, Christians, non-Christians, throughout 2,000 years, Christians have devoted themselves to the teachings of Jesus. That's a sign of a mature follower of God. Amen? And so, brother and sister in the Lord, would others look at your daily life your schedule, your priorities, your resolutions, your goals, 
And as they look at that, would they describe you as devoted to Jesus' words found in his holy scriptures? Do you set aside time each day to sit at his feet in wonder and worship and hear what he has to say to you? My wife sent me a, an article by Scott Hubbard. He writes for Desiring God. And he said, when was the last time you took 15 minutes to look at the clouds and look at the wonder and marvel of God, what he's created? And he says, what actually is happening is that we're going around with roofs over our heads. Do you know what those roofs are? This. Would others look at your life and say that you are devoted to the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Would observers say that you are devoted to your time in the gathering or at family group where, what happens? We delve deep into Jesus' teachings as a response to his saving grace. What we do here is devoting ourselves to the teaching of Jesus Christ. What we do in family group is devoting ourselves to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would others say that you are devoted like Mary was? Or are these things stuff that maybe you hope to get to after everything else is done? After everything else is done. This is a really corny one, and, and maybe it's an old one, but if you guys got it, everyone got it like this. You know what this is? This is a round to it. It's a round to it. Okay, now you've got round to it, now get to following Jesus. <laughs> when do you get to devoting yourself to Jesus? Do you attend one gathering and then miss one, miss two? Miss three, we, we were reminded back in Hebrews chapter 10, Pastor Oni reminded us of the danger when we neglect the gathering. When we neglect the gathering of God's people, there's danger. The writer of Hebrews urges the Christian not to do this, not because attendance is religious and we're doing a tick box exercise. Where are you? Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. No. But because this time, on a Sunday, we pray, we get together, we fellowship, but amongst other things, we devote ourselves to the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just as Mary did, as a worshipful response for all that he's done. But perhaps that's not you. Perhaps you show up to the gathering, you come to family group, you choose to incline your heart towards Jesus each week in the power of the Holy Spirit, but maybe like me and like many others, maybe you're more distracted and anxious about the things of this life, like Mary's sister Martha was. You see, we can fill ourselves with good things. We can fill our calendars with good things, but we can be distracted and anxious while we do those things. Perhaps you're also worried and anxious, and truth be told, you're even rather bitter as you reflect on your life's hectic schedule, difficult circumstances, especially when you compare those to someone else's. And if you're honest, you're actually filled with gross indignation like Martha was. Jonah, how do you know that Martha felt gross indignation? The text tells us. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Now, over the years, Martha's got quite a bad rap, right? Let's take a look at, at what's going on here. Martha is the hostess of the dinner. Hospitality is something that is celebrated and honored throughout Hebrew culture and all of scripture. In fact, just before our text, just before our text in Luke 10, verse 20, in verses 25 to 37, Jesus has taught on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he has called his followers to a next level of hospitality. Hospitality to even the enemies and those they see as unclean. 
And so Martha, let's be honest, is seeking to do the right thing. And that's a good thing, right? She's seeking to do the, good, the right thing. That's a good thing. But let's take a closer verse, a closer look at these verses. Verse 40. Martha was distracted by her many tasks. It's not that she's being hospitable. It's that she's distracted by hospitality. She has forgot why she's doing what she's doing. Or rather, she's forgotten who she's doing it for. You see, family, service, mercy, hospitality is indeed a worshipful response to Jesus. It is indeed a worshipful response to Jesus. Let me read this to you. Ministry for the king can be treasonous if it becomes a replacement of the king himself. And if the peril is how subtle and common and common a shift it is, even for the healthiest of Christian workers. Yet we have this hope. How readily the hearts of healthy ministers fly back to their first love when awakened to the marks of the subtle shift. I want you to hear me. This text today, this message today, is not a verse that lets believers off the hook from being hospitable, from serving, and from showing up. When we read this passage, our response can't be, I knew it. I just need some time to check out a church. I just want to sit at Jesus' feet in worship. Just me, my coffee, my mug, my journal, and worship. Just me alone. Just give me three months. Figure this out. And then I'll come back. Now hear me. Your personal devotional time with God is incredibly important. We should have these times each and every single day. We, but we preach this every single Sunday here at Roots of Fellowship. We were not de designed to live in isolation. We were made for fellowship and community. And one of the best places for devotion to Jesus and reminders about who Jesus is, is within community. And we're a part of a community. You know who else was part of a community? Martha was part of a community. And so, just like Martha, we are called to serve the body with our time, our treasures, and our talents. Just like Martha did. Let's honor her. And so thank you, Lord, for the example of Martha, serving with her time, her treasures, and her talents. But you see, family, it's not Martha's service and hospitality that's the issue. Let that sink in. It's not her service and her hospitality and her serving that's the issue. It's that she's become distracted, worried, and anxious by all that needs to be done, that she's taken her eyes off of Jesus and she's missing him in the busyness of serving. And how do we know that? How do we know that she's missing him? Well, Luke 9, chapters Luke 9, Luke 9, verses 10 to 17. Commentators say that Martha was most likely present when Jesus did what? When he fed 5,000 families lunch with five loaves of bread and two fish. And so I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that Jesus can handle a quaint lunch at Martha's house for 30 people. But she's forgotten who Jesus is and what he's done. She's seen him do it before, and so he could clearly do it again. But clearly, something is causing her to miss him in the midst of serving. Ambassadors, those of us who serve here, are you missing him in the midst of serving? It's a warning sign to so many of us who worship him through serving God's people faithfully. Brother and sisters, like I said, from first-time ambassador right up to pastor and elder, friend, has your service of the Lord caused you to become distracted, busy, worried, and anxious so much that you're missing the opportunities to sit at his feet and worship him out of love, adoration, thanksgiving, and devotion. You see, family, our worship through service, which is a good, godly thing, must flow from our devotional worship to Jesus. It must flow from who Jesus is and what he's done. We respond with our first and best. If we don't know who he is and what he's done, if we take our eyes off that, how can we respond? 
We must avoid prioritizing the Lord's work, the Lord's work, over the Lord's presence in our lives. We have to prioritize the Lord's presence over the Lord's work at all costs. Because you see, when we do take our eyes off Jesus, we forget who he is, all that he's done. And that's when we do what? We respond like Martha does. Second part of verse 40, Lord, don't you care? Have you said that to God before? Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left me in serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? Remember two weeks ago, Elder Kenny took us through the disciples' exact same response to Jesus as he slept in the boat while the storms raged around in Mark 4. Lord, they said, don't you care? And we say too, don't you care about my issues, God? Whilst others are out there thriving, relaxing, chilling, I'm struggling. Don't you care? I'm anxious. I'm worried. I'm so busy. I'm drowning. And look at Jesus' beautifully gentle and compassionate response to Martha. Verse 41, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha, you were worried and upset about many things. Martha, Martha. Now, family, I want you to put aside your current day reading of the double name, okay? Because it sounds as if Jesus is like super frustrated, like Martha, Martha. It's almost like a full name address. Did you ever get that? So I knew if I got called Jonathan Paul, trouble was coming my way. And so perhaps that's your misconception when you read this address. But actually, throughout Scripture, when a person's name is repeated, it implies intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. We see this when God speaks to Abraham in Genesis 22. It says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Genesis 46, the Lord speaks to Jacob and he says, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob. God speaks to Moses, Exodus 3. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Samuel, in 1 Samuel 3, and the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Saul, who became Paul, and falling to the ground in Acts 9, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuted? And now we have that here with Martha. It's quite a league to be in, right? We honor Martha. Martha, Martha. You see, family, when God speaks like this, he reminds us that he is a relational God. He speaks to get our attention and he speaks to our hearts. He is the God who pursues intimacy with us. Jesus is saying, Martha, Martha. You can almost hear his hug as he says it. It says, Martha, I know you. I see all that you're doing for me. And for others. I love you. But I love you too much to leave you there. So he says, verse 42, one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from you. One thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from you. What's he saying? Well, theologians say that the right choice, the right choice that Jesus speaks of here is most likely the prioritization of the things of God, the heavenly kingdom, the words of God, the teachings of Jesus compared to the things of this world, lunch, dishes, catering. We see that throughout scripture, that choosing the things of God will always, always be more important than the temporary things of this life. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. The things and the concerns of this world will wither and fade, family, but the words of God, the teachings of Jesus, will remain forever. And so what's our response? If that's the case, then what's our response? Well, we should be like Mary, 
and the words of the Lord should have first claim for the disciple of Jesus. If you call yourself a disciple, a follower of Jesus, his word should have first claim in your life. An attitude of learning and obedience to Jesus should take first place in our lives. First slot in our calendars. Even over loving service. Hear me? Service should be in there, but it shouldn't be the first. Family, if the word of God and our devotion to it, both corporately on Sundays and a family group and individually in our daily lives, if it isn't preeminent, well, then we're heading for burnout. We're heading for a tumultuous end to 2023. And 2023 is going to roll on, and 2024 is going to roll on, and 2025, and then we're going to look, wake up one day and be like, what happened? I'm going to call the band up as I wrap things up. So family, as I wrap things up, I want you to hear me. There are two things that this message is not. Two things this message is not. It is not a call to merely study God's word. The ultimate goal of theology is not knowledge, but worship. A senior Acts 29 church pastor and theologian, Pastor Sam Storm, says this. If our learning and knowledge of God do not lead to the joyful praise of God, we have failed. Another way of putting it is to say that theology without doxology is idolatry. The only theology worth studying is a theology that can be sung. Truth be told, family, if you came in this morning and you just sang those four songs, you would have heard this message because they were so perfectly chosen, led by the Holy Spirit. Here I am to worship. Better is one day in your hearts. We welcome you with praise. The other Christian artist, Shai Lin, puts it this way. If a theologian is not your thing, well, then a Christian artist can maybe get your attention. Shai Lin says this. He says, theology is the study of God, and it's very important. Doxology is an expression of praise to God. So the point here is that all theology should ultimately lead to doxology. If theology doesn't lead to doxology, then we've actually missed the point of theology. So if you have theology without doxology, you just have dead, cold orthodoxy, dead religion. Horrible, right? On the other side, we have people who say, ah, forget about theology. I just want to praise, right? But if we have doxology without theology, we actually have idolatry. So I know it becomes all about my preferences and my desires because I take my eyes off Jesus. Because it's just a random expression of praise, but it's not actually informed by the truth of who God is. So God is concerned with both theology and doxology. He's concerned with an accurate understanding of Him and that accurate understanding of Him leading to a response of praise, adoration, and worship towards Him. Many of you will know Pastor John Piper. When it comes to theology, I mean, this man is theologically accurate. But I remember hearing him once say that once in his life, he made a prayer stool. He made a prayer stool. And he carved this prayer stool out of his own hands. And he said, I made this prayer stool for one reason and one reason only. So that every morning I got on that prayer stool and I bowed down and I remembered and I said, God, I'm bowing because you are God and I'm that's all that I don't understand. I'm acknowledging that you are God and I'm not. So this message is not a call to mere study of God's word for the studying's sake. Our devotion to God's teaching must lead us to worship him for who he is and for what he's done. Just as we saw Mary respond to him this morning. Secondly, this message is not merely a call to rest. Honestly, that's what I had originally thought this text and this message would be. But it's actually not a call to rest. Even though rest is important and it's God-honoring. I once heard at a conference that sometimes the most godly and spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. And as a, as a new parent, I say amen. 
And again, if we look at Jesus two weeks ago in Elder Kenny's message, what is Jesus doing in the midst of the storms? He's sleeping. He's resting in the boat. God calls us to rest. But that's not what this message is calling us to. It's calling us to reorient our lives in a way that we are able to put the things of God in their rightful place. Right at the very center. And of course, let's be honest, very often, that means that that compels us to slow down, to rest as a result of it. And so this message is a call to worship and devotion in our walk with Jesus first, before anything else. And it's a call to us as disciples and followers of Jesus to reprioritize the things of our lives, to be obedient, even with our calendars, so that they might reflect who is Lord over them, and that we may not be anxious and distracted because of the many, many things, even the godly things, just like Martha was. C.S. Lewis penned these beautiful words. He says, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. Himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. And of course, even Jesus says these words in John 15, verses four to five. He says, abide in me. Stop, take time, sit, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he is the one that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so at this moment, I want you to pause. I want you to reflect on the fruit of your life. Is there an abundance of fruit or are we experiencing a drought? And as we head toward the end of the year, is the tank still full? Or are we running on reserve? And so what is Jesus calling the martyrs in us to? Well, practically, what does it look like to make the right choice as Mary did? What does it look like to run on God himself? What does it look like to abide in him? How can we urgently pursue individual and corporate devotional times with God? Slow down. Slow down and focus on Jesus above the things in this world. As I mentioned earlier, we're fast approaching Christmas. And so how are we gonna spend the rest of the year? Are we gonna frantically fill our calendars with all the end of year socials and functions we absolutely have to do? We have to attend this, we have to see that person, we have gotta catch up with them. Are we gonna be stressed and anxious about all the things we need to accomplish in the next two months? Or are we gonna prioritize our times with the Lord to the life-giving words of Jesus? Are we gonna pray about our one mores that we can invite to our Advent and Christmas series and gatherings? Are we gonna prayerfully consider how we can be as generous as possible this end of year? No matter what the rest of 2023 has in store for us, no matter what Christmas looks like, no matter what we're gonna do for lunch or how many people will be there, may we not be like Martha, distracted, anxious, and worried. May we not let that draw us away from being obedient disciples of the Lord who prioritize spending time at His feet, in His Word, and worshiping Him in our daily lives and corporately together, amen? Family, Christmas is a time that's supposed to be all about worshiping Jesus. Every time is about worshiping Jesus, but Christmas is as well. And so often though, we make it all about lunch, holidays, bonuses, we become so distracted by the many things and the many tasks that we miss the opportunity to reflect on the first coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when He came to earth as a baby in a manger. A baby in the manger who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what this is all about. Amen? So family, I want to reiterate that we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth certainly does lead us to service. Service is a form of worship, but we cannot worship God even through service without loving Him first as a response to Him loving us first by creating us, sending us Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sins, sending us the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that we would come to the prayer corner after this gathering. I pray that there would be many up here, that many of us would fall on our knees, that He would cause us to hunger and thirst for Him once again in the power of the Holy Spirit that our spirits would be awakened to His goodness and glory and the sheer wonder of God. In fact, let's do that right now. Would you stand and pray with me? If you feel like you want to kneel and sit, please respond. Oh, Heavenly Father, we confess that we've forgotten, Lord God. We've forgotten who you are. We've forgotten what you've done, Lord God. We've made it all about us. We've become anxious and worried. We've become distracted by the things, even the godly things of this world. Forgive us, Lord. We thank you that you are a gracious, merciful, and loving, kind God, that even as we ask that prayer, Lord, you've forgiven us already because you died on a cross for us for all of our sins, past, present, and future. So we praise you, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord God, for the times that we've taken our eyes off you, that we've become so fixated on our phones, our devices, our calendars, our things of this world, that we've forgotten to look up to the glory of the heavens to see that you love us, that every day you write in the sky that you love us. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we have Jesus. Thank you that we have one another. Thank you that we have the space, this church, our groups, friends, family, Lord God. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. May we respond. May we be like Mary. May we come devotionally and sit at your feet day by day. I pray that you would do that. Empower us in the power of of your Holy Spirit. And then, Lord God, those of us who are here, maybe you have heard this message for the first time, do something mighty in their lives, Lord God. I pray that they would come to faith in you. May we serve them and love them well. May we as a church serve and love each other well. May we remind ourselves of who, whose we are. And may we encourage one another to finish this year strong. Not strong by our worldly standard, Lord God, but as more mature disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord God, be our everything. Be our vision. Be our everything. In Jesus' name.